and welcome to the inaugural episode of the Misfits of Horror podcast. I'm Rick Rebello, joined by my co-host, Josh Gravel. How's it going, Josh? It's going great. I'm very glad that we're finally doing this thing we've talked about for years. <laughs> uh, for those of you who don't know, because you probably don't know us since this is our first episode, uh, Josh and I uh, both ran the Rhode Island International Horror Film Festival and the Rocket Shop Film Festival for over a decade for each one. And even though we've been talking horror now for close to 20 years, we never got around to doing a podcast. So now we're finally taking the time to sit down and discuss what Josh and I have been discussing together for a generation. So how do you think about that, Josh? Uh, you know, I think it's good. As I joked, um, th this is what all of our get-together conversations are like anyway. So... We've said dozens of times we should just do a podcast, and here we are. <laughs> yeah, we finally got to it. Yes, yes. So, so the, to, the, um, the this podcast is to try to look at something old and something new. At least, certainly for the first couple episodes, that's going to be the theme: something old and something new. And for the opening episode, we want to start out 2023 with arguably uh, one of the first horror films that come out of the gate in 2023, uh, which is The Pale Blue Eye. Mm. So, Josh, what do you know about The Pale Blue Eye? Uh, well, I didn't know anything going into it. All yeah. I heard was period piece, Edgar Allan Poe as a character, yep. and that it was a mystery of sorts. So that was enough to hook me. Yeah. Yeah, same here. Uh I had seen the trailer uh, towards the end of 2022 and being a huge Poe buff, I was super stoked uh, to see Poe being done with a little bit of money behind it and with some great actors behind it. Uh, you know, Poe over the years has often been, you know, just something that Roger Corman will do or, you know, something usually done low budget because most of Poe's stuff now is public domain. But to see a real interesting, not it's not an adaptation of Poe's work. It's actually an adaptation of a book by uh, Louis Bayard. Uh, but it feels like an adaptation of a Poe uh, story, uh, at least to me. What do you well, think? I, I, I think it feels that way because it, it definitely takes steps to work in um, themes um, that, that would run through Poe's work. And... It sets up, um, as I have not read the book, but as far as the film goes, they set up a visual style that kind of, it, it is in tune with what you imagine when reading Poe's work. Um, it's almost set up to say that, like, this is a life experience that would have influenced Poe's future output. Right especially when you look at things like murders in the rue morgue yes poe has yeah. often been cited as as the author who created the genre of the detective the, the yes the, the, the detective mystery yes yeah yeah um and then there are either uh, other elements uh character names that are in this uh, or uh other elements that you could see in in a way influencing like even like fall of the house of usher and things like that so um i thought it was interesting that it kind of weaved in a handful of small elements that weren't like super in your face and obvious but like uh when you go back and you think about it you go okay so so in in the theory of this world that it's created is that years later poe goes off and you know, writes this story and this one, you know, incident could have possibly been a, a, an influence on it. And this one person could have possibly been an influence for this character, you know? Uh, so it was very interesting in that respect. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, a lot of the other things I really liked about the film is I think it does a good job of capturing the tone uh, that Poe put across in words. Uh, mm. It is bleak. It yeah. is cold. Mm -hmm. It is Virginia in winter. You know, and you you get that feeling uh, of that sort of colonial life and lifestyle. Yeah, it is miserable. <laughs> it is miserable. <laughs> yeah. Like every shot of this film looks miserable. Yeah, it does not look like a joyous life. 
you know? No, no. And I'm not putting down the film. Like, I, I believe that in many ways, that is exactly what the film wanted to convey. Yeah. That, that um, you know, there's no, there's not a lot of sunshine and happy times. <laughs> uh, and, you know, Poe's life it was a life of tragedy. You know? Yes. Mm -hmm. His mother died when he was very young, lost his parents, you know, uh, he had to live, he, he was living with another uh, family. Obviously they raised him. Mm -hmm. He felt like he was never loved or appreciated. And I, I think that comes across, uh, they cover a bit of Poe's drinking and his gambling. Yes. Which was a huge factor yeah. in Poe's personal life. Mm -hmm. So you can see, you can see that that it has started ramping at this stage in his life. Yes, yeah. I mean yeah. he had such a short life. You know, yeah. when you think about it, he's playing you know an adolescent in this film. You know, someone in his late teens and twenties, and that was he was already not unbeknowingly halfway through his life. Really, R right, right. Um, so so getting past this, I think we should discuss the. Uh, I mean, obviously, we don't want to give anything away with the story. Yeah. Um, but, but I think uh, we should delve into the actual story um, and the cast. The yeah. cast, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, so um, we have Christian Bale yep. as Augustus Landor, who is a former police detective that is called in to... Um, to solve to solve a crime that there there has been what is initially thought of as a suicide that is very suspicious mm -hmm. um and i i think that that it was a good setup um because it it immediately showed us a number of characters that just either seemed shady or suspicious right um, and, you know, I, I think it's not giving too much away to at least say the setup that he is called in because there is a cadet who was initially thought to have hung himself, but then somebody cut the, the heart out of the body um, afterward. So um, that obviously brings suspicion that, you know, it, it wasn't just a run of the mill suicide. Correct. Right. Yeah, and Christian Bale is perfect as this really world weary uh, veteran mm. who Annapolis uh, goes after to help solve this crime. Yes, so because yeah. because at this point in his life he has uh, he has left um, police work mm -hmm. and uh, has you know kind of somewhat retired to a hermit style you know type of lifestyle in the woods um and um so he is very much the the outsider yes yeah so yes. Um, is, i believe his wife has died yes his daughter has left for some reason right right his, his daughter is no longer there she is you know left and is not returning mm -hmm. it is it is stated very plainly in that fact yeah um okay. He's he's sort of grieving, you know. Yeah, which is interesting because it's it's kind of um, it's kind of a lot of what Poe went through in Poe's life. Mm. Uh, Poe had uh, lost a lot of women in his life. Yes, um, yes, and I, I think that it's an interesting uh, part of that part of the story. Uh, and I want to give really a lot of props. I mean, Christian Bale being awesome is not going to surprise anybody. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> the moment you see the trailer it's like you, you know you're going to get a five star performance from Christian Bale so I got to give it to Harry Melling uh, yeah. as uh, Edgar Allan Poe uh, Harry Melling is a graduate of the Harry Potter series mm. where he was at that time you know a child basically but man does he look like Edgar Allan Poe oh yeah it, it, it is off putting yeah, in, 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 in a way, um, and while granted, we have no way of knowing Poe's true mannerisms right. or uh, you know speech patterns, things like that. Um, I think Melling's performance 
did a lot to capture how what we can imagine Poe was like without venturing into like caricature. Yes. Yeah. No, there's a certain verisimilitude to to his Poe. Like it's what every now and then you see a performance where it's like your mind just accepts like, oh, that's that's the person. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I think Melling really nails that. Like you really even with the slight genteel southern accent that he puts on. Yeah. And just his affectations and the way he looks and everything is just it, it's gonna be hard to to think or see anyone else as as po, certainly a young Poe. Yes. You know, we, we've seen a lot of people play Poe over the years. Um uh, you know, Jeffrey Combs, who actually played did a, a Poe show with at Rock and Shock one year. Yes. Yeah. We were running Rock and Shock. Uh, a lot of great actors have played Poe uh throughout time. But this one, I think, is going to stick. Uh, I, I think is really wonderful. And I also think the supporting cast of the film, uh, which is also the supporting cast, also seems like a collection of, of Harry Potter faces to me. Some of them, I believe. Yes. Yeah. yeah. British character actors. Yeah. Which is great. I, I, I There's nothing I love better than a, a group of British character actors. Yeah. And I think they all just do a great job in lending, you know, a believability and a, a pathos to the film that really makes it kind of work. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, the the other interesting standout to me was uh, Toby Jones, who played yep. the Doctor, because um, uh, he he's always an interesting character actor always. when he pops up. So, um, yeah, it was fascinating. You know, it, the one the one thing uh, I'll get your take on it, but when I when I felt uh, when I watched this, as I I really felt that if, if Hammer Films were still making films. Hammer Films would have made this film. Um, I think Hammer Films would have made a version of this film. Yeah. I think there's a certain, I don't want to give anything away, but yeah. I'm going to say there's a certain structural element to the story. Yeah. Where I think, um, I don't, I'm not saying they would have changed the story, yeah. but I think um, the the way the way we received the information would have been rearranged mm -hmm. so that uh, it was in a more uh, I wouldn't say linear fashion, but that uh, I think mean, they would have given us more clues to what was going on throughout mm -hmm. the film, so that they could have had that big ending. Right. Yes. And it would have been a little bit more body and a little bit more bloody. Yes. Yes. Um, but I still had that feel, you know, that great. Uh, I don't know if it, it's pre-Victorian, I would say Edwardian era uh, sort of feel and look. Mm. I definitely think the conclusion was something that Hammer would do. I, I don't yes. want to give away what the conclusion is, but I, it that definitely especially felt like a Hammer ending. Yes, um, yes. Except that if it was Hammer, it would have... Uh, the. The conclusion would have happened, and then the end would have just flashed on the screen. It, that exactly. That, that that's kind of what I was trying to get at is yeah. is that we we have a large set piece, yeah. but then we have a little bit of a prologue. Yeah. And I think that if Hammer had made this, the information we get in the prologue might have been peppered in as clues to us throughout. Yeah. So that the reveal happened during that big set piece. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So that then then we could have just had a big the end. I'm here on the screen. <laughs> that was the style, you know what I mean? Um, and again, I'm I'm trying not to give anything uh, too much away mm -hmm. um, because I, I very much enjoyed this film. But um, I, did, I have to say that, you know, if the people listening are fans of Hammer and yeah. fans of Roger Corman and fans of Poe, that this is definitely a movie for them. It's it's as good as, I, as they're going to get. I think if in a new film and something coming out uh, today. And it's also worth pointing out that um, the, the direction, it was a very wonderfully made film. Uh, yeah. It was directed by Scott Cooper. And um, let me see here. What was the last thing that I saw that he did? Hold on one second for me because I, should have had this oh yes antlers yeah yes um so he's mostly a director of dramas yes and crime films 
because uh, he had also done Black Mass mm -hmm. um, and Crazy, Crazy Heart. Jeff Bridges. Yep. But, but yeah, the, the film he did before this was Antlers, mm -hmm. which was a fantastic kind of a modern take of like a, it's got a little bit of a full car type of twist to it. Yes. Um, I don't know if you saw that one. I did. Oh, excellent, excellent. That was so, one of the better horror films of the last couple of years, previous couple of years. Yeah, so so people saw Antlers and enjoyed that. Um, it's definitely probably worth checking out Pale Blue Eye as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, any final thoughts on uh, Pale Blue Eye? Um, I guess I can just sum up by saying that um, it is a beautiful looking film, even though it is an extremely drab film and it the story is very engaging um with great characters great actors good direction um so it's definitely a film i'd recommend yeah me too and i say uh, uh, building on what you were saying you know it's it's one of those films that feels cold yes I mean, yeah. yes, it's shot in winter, but there's something <laughs> about the desolation and, like you said, the time and the period and everything. You know, it's it's a. a per, I I said it when I when I when people first asked me about it. I said it's a perfect dead of winter film. You yes, know? yes, and and there are many times where there are character interactions where the people look cold. Yes, <laughs> yeah, they look uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, films like this, obviously, The Thing, you know, uh, The Dead Zone. Yeah. Those yep. are always my my snowstorm. Yes. Yep. You know, mm. because there's something about those three films. Well, now with this one, those three films especially. Yeah. That just, they make you want to put on a jacket, you know? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but there's a beauty to that because, like I said, you feel that isolation. You know? Yes. You feel that, you know sadness like the, the dead zone in this you know both have that heavy weight of sadness and loss yeah i think that really give them an extra impact so mm, definitely definitely but i definitely if you if you're watching definitely check it out it's on netflix it's one of those films that i think is just going to get lost in the tidal wave which is netflix yeah that that is a a larger issue to discuss with the the modern world of streaming services yeah, the amount of content coming at us all the time, um, and the amount of content where somebody could tell you, "Hey, check this movie out; it's really good," but if you don't watch it that week, it's buried and you've yeah. forgotten about it. Well, I mean, just this weekend alone, uh, I watched "There's Something Wrong with the Children" and yeah. "Sick," mm -hmm. and boy, I tell you, I look forward to talking about those two movies as well. Yeah, I haven't seen There's Something Wrong with the Children yet, but we we watched Sick last night. So Yeah, Sick, Sick was really good. Yeah. I yeah. really liked it. And I mean, it's what, the 21st of January right now? And I, I've probably seen already a half a dozen great horror films, you know. Yeah. Horror yeah. films that under any other year, you know, would definitely already be at the top of everybody's list. Yeah, definitely. definitely. So, but like you said, because they're coming fast and furious... It's it's, it's and tough. yeah. The problem is that there's so many streaming services. Yeah. So sometimes six months later, somebody will mention something to me, and I'll be like, "Oh, I never even heard about that." Right. And then I go, "It's exclusive to you know this streaming service that I don't have." So, um, because you can't have everything. <laughs> no. Well, you know, it's funny you you bring this up because one of the things I talk about with my students. Uh, is that when we were growing up, you and I, that movies had a huge longevity, mm -hmm. you know, because of that that giant gap between the uh, film in the theater and VHS, where you'd have a year, two years, you know, yeah, longer period of time. You know, when you and I grew up, when we heard about Texas Chainsaw Massacre, we couldn't pick up the phone and just immediately start watching Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Right. You know, yeah. if the video store had it, maybe we could rent it. Yeah. You know, if not, it could be, you know, films lived in legend back then. Right. And 
I mean, it wasn't uncommon. I mean, I know we caught the tail end of this being a really common thing, mm -hmm. but like, so like a movie would come out and then two years later, it would come out again. Right. You know, where it would maybe just pop up, at, you know, as the, the second feature in drive-ins for the right. summer. Um, I mean, Oz was really famous for doing that. Right. Star right. Wars. Yeah. So, so uh, I mean, that was more popular prior to the home video boom. Um, but even if you think about the home video boom, I mean, a ton of movies would come out in a week. But a lot of stores, you know, they allocated enough space where something would stay on that new release wall for two, three weeks. So the average customer going in once a week had a chance to see that box right. before it got buried into the regular A through Z shelves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, even then, it's like, you know, if you went to a mom and pop, they didn't have so many films. Right. So, you know, whatever would stay there would stick. And I think that's why, yeah, I don't know. I can't speak for you, but, you know, the big boxes that I would rent would often be horror films that were just there forever. Right. But, you know, my, my comment on the new release wall is more um, analogous to like, you had that new release wall for a couple of weeks. Yes. Now a movie hits a streaming service and it's the banner for a day. Yeah. You know? If so. That. Right. Right. So, <laughs> so like if you don't look at that streaming service that day and get that ad on the top, you that movie might not get promoted to you. Right. That's <laughs> why, I mean, I'll be honest, I, I've been leaning heavily on a lot of other horror podcasts, uh, I listened to the Stephen King uh, podcast and well, the two major Stephen King podcasts, and they talk to a lot of um, filmmakers and writers and things like that. So usually whenever a filmmaker is shilling their new horror film, you know, they're on the podcast. So luckily I've been exposed to a lot of stuff that way. Yeah. And I, I've been able to tune my Twitter so that it's basically a, a, a horror central Twitter account. Yeah. I've been able to zone out all the political stuff and all yeah. the hate <laughs> speech and just kind of, because, you know, one blessing that we do have nowadays that we never had before is that, you know, we can see and read what our favorite horror people are thinking. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yesterday, yesterday, the day before, McGarris was talking about. Uh, Deadstream, which was one of my favorite horror films of last year. Mm -hmm. And Joseph Winter, the director, uh, chimed in and, you know, he was like, oh, my God, I can't believe you yeah. know, Mick Garris is pumping up my movie. And I'm like, you know, that's the kind of stuff that if if, if you can create a media bubble uh, for horror, that you're able to keep, you know, things sort of in your chamber a little bit longer. Whereas the average person, like you said, if they don't see that preview or that thing, they're just they're, it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a different world and we're coping with it. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking yeah. of streaming services, so yeah. our, our new old film uh, today is we've been able to watch recently, thanks to a streaming service, uh, most specifically Shudder, which if, if, if you're out there and, and you love horror films and you don't have Shudder, I don't know if you love horror films that much because... Boy, they, they've been bringing it. I mean, they have done... Yeah, I, I, I know there are a couple of um, horror-specific streaming services. Yeah. Um, But from poking around, Shudder really is kind of the, 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 the top name yeah. for like a genre-specific streaming service. Um, they, they do a great job of curating um a lot of older titles um and it it feels curated because yes you know, especially the film we're going to talk about today it's like unless you're someone who really really knows the horror genre yeah appreciates it you wouldn't even think to go after this film right but at the same time i i i can concede that a lot of their stuff is probably licensed in packages so they're probably just dealing with a specific distributor um but they know the right distributors to deal with. Absolutely. Um, along with that, their new output of the Shutter exclusives or Shutter originals, mm -hmm. um, which seem to be a combination of either um, things that they got into word of in the production phase and maybe helped along, 
or more often things that they picked up on the festival circuit. Um, they they give a really good selection of newer modern horror. Yes. And newer modern horror from around the world. Yes. Um, so I think they're they're giving a good outlet for a lot of new filmmakers mm -hmm. and a lot of uh foreign filmmakers that we normally wouldn't get on a regular streaming service. Mm -hmm. And it's a good selection because um I think they said before, as far as the exclusives and the originals they put up one thing a week and that's great because like one, one week you might get um, a comedy horror. And then the next week you might have something that's more like the, the, the French new wave of horror right. and more extreme. But then the next week you might have something that's like a, a found footage horror. So there's constantly, it's, it's never like, consistently the same thing so it's literally a something for everyone situation yeah yeah absolutely um you know i think about uh their, their hundred uh, i actually showed my students their their hundred best uh horror scenes yeah and, you know i know rebecca McHenry who writes for fango and i think a lot of fango writers uh have some sort of input over a shutter um and they have rebecca McHenry's film last year glorious yes uh, also on there but like a, a a lot of their stuff uh you know glorious was a good one like i said deadstream deadstream was fantastic that fantastic. came out of nowhere and was one of the best films of last year and the funny thing about deadstream is when i first like saw the trip i was like i'm gonna hate this yeah and then i started watching it and then i watched it again and then i watched it again <laughs> i watched it again and i watched it again <laughs> um but yeah i when when Shutter first started, because I, I remember hopping on right away, it was not curated very well, and I got out pretty quick. Um, about halfway through last year, I started noticing all the really great stuff on there, and I believe you know a, a year subscription is something like you know forty fifty bucks. Yeah, it's like fifty dollars with the fees. It's less than sixty bucks, I think. Right. And I got in a couple of years ago, and the curation has gotten better. But I also think when it started, it was a matter of what can we get our hands on? Right. You know what I mean? So it was a little more scattershot. Mm -hmm. um, but even pretty early on, they started with the with the originals um, and, and the, the in-house productions. Um, and well, that's Creepshow what was a big attraction early yeah. on because Creepshow yeah. was really like their launch, their big launch title. Right, right. But even before that, um, I they, they had like a couple of like smaller series is like earlier on. Mm -hmm. Um, and like I said, the stuff they were pick out, picking up from film festivals. Yeah. Um, and that's what kept me on there earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's definitely grown into more of its own brand. Second film today, our older film, is been highlighted as as we talked about by Shutter. Uh, the film is. Possession from 1981, directed by Andre Zulowski. Uh, if I say that wrong, I apologize. It's, uh, it's, starring it's how I've always said it, but we yeah. could both be wrong. <laughs> it's one of those things like, you, 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 as, as a teacher, I always hate the first day of class because I have to say everybody's name. <laughs> and, you know, it, there's more butchering in, in that than Cannibal Holocaust. <laughs> you know. Uh, so, um, let's talk about this. So I had not seen this prior to, uh, this streaming engagement on shutter and people on Twitter and the horrorverse were going bonkers, uh, blowing it up. So I was really stoked to finally get to see it and man, oh man, it did not, uh, disappoint as far as being completely crazy. Uh, Josh, what's your background with this film and your take on it? So I, I, I actually find this very interesting since you you knew of this film, but you are now just coming to it yep. with this new transfer. So I saw this movie on VHS, had no idea what was going on. I saw the old Anchor Bay DVD. Mm -hmm. I think it was a double feature DVD with uh, Mario Bava's Shock. Oh, all right. S had slightly more idea of what was going on. 
-hmm. but like there are certain like apartment scenes and stuff where you just you're like i think something's moving (laughs) (laughs) you know what i mean yeah um so i did not get this blu-ray that i think mondo released but this i believe is the transfer that was done um with the blu-ray um and this transfer is a revelation yeah you can see what's going on um now in a way for many years the bad transfers are part of what were part of the the lore and reputation of this film where people are like i saw this movie and there is something messed up going on but i'm not sure exactly what i was looking at yeah exactly yeah yeah (laughs) Um, luckily for the movie, now that you can see exactly what you're looking at, it's like a, a, a final payoff for all the hype, right? you know, right. um, because this movie does get weird and, um, it is extremely off-putting. It is, uh, you know, um, as someone who, who went through a, a divorce in the last few years, you know, I can attest to how, you know, horrific and difficult that is. Mm, mm-hmm. And this film, I think, really does an amazing job of dealing with the subconscious of how crazy that is, like the, those feelings are. Yes. yes. Um, and it obviously takes it to a dark place and a strange place. And I, to me, this film is to divorce what a racer head is to having a baby. Mm, mm. And and what's fascinating too is for the many years that we could not discern exactly what was happening in the horror sequences, what really what the other thing that really propelled this movie was the high quality of the filmmaking and the dramatic acting intention. Yeah. Because you could cut out all the horror elements. Mm -hmm. And this is still a relationship drama, like on Eleven. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. But then, so we also have to acknowledge this movie is from 1981 and is shot in Berlin. Yes. And it is shot, like, 50% of this movie pretty much takes place at the Berlin Wall. Yes. Like, like there are literally you are driving down the street and streets are cut off by the wall. You're looking out the apartment window. And you're looking at guards standing at the wall, mm-hmm. you know? Um, so there is, there is both a social tension outside and then this massive relationship tension going on inside. Well, and one of the things that it kind of leaves up and never really explains and if this is a spoiler for anyone, I apologize for a spoiler for a 40 year old movie. Uh, Sam Neill was some sort of agent of some kind. Right. So my gathering and this is hypothesizing is that he is in East Berlin and he was some sort of secret agent performing a job in West Berlin. Yeah. Um, and I gather that just because he, he gets so the opening of the film is he returns home. He has been away from work for a very long time. I don't think they really specify the amount of time, but clearly it has been an, an unusually long amount of time. Mm-hmm. Um, there is immediate tension uh, between Sam Neill and his wife, played by Isabella Johnny. Um, and so you come quickly to realize that she is leaving him. She has found somebody else. And um, he is he is both trying to adjust to being back home and almost immediately, you know, in this confrontation about the relationship. Um, I, I, I also do agree with the hypothesis that he was some sort of agent because the um, shots of the wall from the apartment that I mentioned, that's always him looking out the window at the wall as as if he's watching for somebody to come for him yeah and i I believe there's also shots of ddr soldiers looking at them over yes over the wall yeah yeah uh so that's why i'm saying is like they look out the window and there are soldiers just looking now because i would imagine that if you were a millennial or younger you're looking at that and you're like i i don't know what that is i don't understand the context um i 
there we do still have the uh what is it the the dmz in korea mm -hmm. so there is still something but i feel like the separation in korea isn't as much of our constant social awareness right. as the berlin wall was well the berlin wall you know especially you know, for those of us who grew up in the 70s and 80s, obviously, you know, the, Reagan took down, helped to take down the wall uh, in the 1980s, latter half of the 1980s. But it was it was such a disgust thing. It was a thing that so many books had been written about. So many movies have been made about mm -hmm. I mean, even a movie, a, a comedy like Gotcha. Yeah. You know, yeah. with Anthony Edwards was about the Berlin Wall, you know. Yeah. Um, so it was really much, you know, it, very much in the zeitgeist at that time. Yes. Yeah. So I, I think it, it played into it. But like you said, I think it adds to, you know, that, that general feeling of unease that this film gives you. Right. So so as I mentioned, so Sam Neill, he has he has come home. He's immediately faced with a a relationship issue. Um, Isabella Johnny tells him that she she has met somebody new and that she is leaving. Um, then she starts leaving the house intermittently right. and for, you know, days or hours at a time, uh, Sam Neill tracks down the, the guy who, who is, she is now in a relationship mm -hmm. only to find out that she hasn't been with him and that he wants to know where she is as well. So there is now a fourth party involved in this uh in in this situation his love and, quadrangle and and i don't i don't want to really go into what is involved in the in the fourth party but pretty much the more that is explored the more erratic and dangerous isabella johnny's like behavior becomes right um from you know um just e emotional outbursts to um, self harm mm -hmm. to uh, to physical outbursts and uh, it it is a powerful and uh, I don't want to say disturbing performance but it's really it really affects you. Yeah, I mean both Isabella Johnny and Sam Neill they yeah. go for it. There's yes, no holding back. Yeah. Um, you know, to the to the point where it's about as far out as an actor or an actress can go in a performance without you laughing at them because it's so intense. Mm -hmm. I think the intensity and the darkness is is kind of what saves it from being too over the top. Because what you're seeing, what you're seeing manifested essentially is how they feel mentally and emotionally, and and that's where I draw the correlation with. Um, Eraserhead, yeah, you know, because to me, Eraserhead's always been about, you know, a man, a young man gets a woman pregnant, and he has no understanding of relationships, children, in laws, and everything to him looks alien and crazy, and yeah, just you know, and this, I feel this film does the same thing with divorce in that, you know, you're with someone for a long period of time, and then one day they're alien to you they're, they're not that person right and your mind is trying to deal with the the familiarity you have with them and then also with the fact that you're no longer familiar with them yes and there's yes. a complexity to that that is almost impossible to explain certainly to people who haven't gone through it you know right. and I want to. I just want to spoil a little bit here for those uh, listening. Like I said, it's a forty-year-old movie. I mean, but I feel that the fourth person or entity uh, is Isabella Johnny trying to manifest the Sam Neil that she had been married to. Oh, entirely, entirely. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah. Because um, it does feel like you know what happened to that other person now. As much as I don't want to give things away, yeah. Regarding this fourth entity, 
Do you think at this point it's safe to discuss a little bit of what it is so that we, oh, we can talk? Okay, be, because I feel like what people have heard about this film already, that's probably what they've been told about. Right. Um, so so you, you come to find out that she has a whole separate apartment where she is hiding this amorphous tentacly being yeah lovecraftian yes cronenbergian body horror yes that that slowly over the course of the film takes on a more human appearance yes um given that the, the more people that are fed to it it takes on a more human appearance which you know get me tell me if i'm wrong but doesn't that part of the movie kind of feel like a precursor to hellraiser in a way, yeah. I mean, you could really see that if Clive Barker, and Clive Barker is the type of person who, who I guarantee loves this movie, mm -hmm. that when he saw that, there had to have been a little bit of something that motivated him uh, to create Hellraiser. Right. And and the, the reason I, 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 I pushed where I was like, I think we should just, you know, divulge and discuss the yeah. creature is um this movie has some amazing creature effects oh, now that now that you can finally see what's moving in that room like there is some like astounding and gross stuff going on <laughs> um and a lot of that is the work of uh carlo rambaldi yeah and um the much blind people... carlo rambaldi yeah well so here's the thing carlo rambaldi He's not a commonly known name, um, even amongst cinephiles. But this is a man whose special effects career has some of the highest of the highs and lowest of the lows. I mean, the man made this and then did E.T. Right. This is the same guy same that year. created Same e. year, 1981. Yeah. I think, yeah, or, or even next year, maybe. Oh, actually, either yes, way, yeah. the, you know, in his filmography, Possession is followed immediately by E.T., mm -hmm. which is then followed immediately by The NeverEnding Story, <laughs> and right. then followed immediately by Conan the Destroyer, yeah. where he apparently did the, the creature design for Dagoff. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, he, he did do a lot of cheapy, crappier films. Um, well, the, the most famous being the Terrible Werewolf and Silver Bullet. Yes. I'd yeah. say that's probably the most infamous, I should say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, but, I mean, his career, um, he did uh, Argento's Deep Red. Um, he did both uh, Flesh for Frankenstein and Blood for Dracula. And uh, let's see here. You know what? Going all the way back to... He did... Um, Full cheese lizard in a woman's skin, which um, it has an infamous dream sequence in which the lead character um, walks into a room in which there is like a animal experimentation going on, and there are vivisected dogs. Mm -hmm. And um, much like the infamous story behind Cannibal Holocaust, Carlo Rambaldi had to go to a court and operate the mechanical dog puppets to prove that they weren't actually torturing animals in that film. <laughs> no, I believe it. But yeah. I think it's interesting because I think people forget that when you, when you look at makeup effects, you know, it's like you had Dick Smith and then you had in the seventies, obviously Tom Savini, but there was so few people who actually did it. Yeah. You know, and Rebaldi kind of had the the market cornered on Europe. Yep. Yep. Um, and that's how he probably, you know, obviously ended up with this film. But getting back to what you're saying, what's interesting about the way this thing, the, this manifestation gets revealed. And it feels a lot like um, the uh, that scene in Mieke's film where... You know, she's talking on the phone and then we see the bag in the background and the film was like just a, a romance up until that point. You know? Oh, yes. An audition. Yes. Audition. Yeah. 
Audition yeah. is just a, ro- a romance up until that point, and then all of a sudden it just falls off the table, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. And this film, you know, it's a divorce film. You know, it's basically a lifetime movie to a certain point, and then whoop. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. both both films go switch gears so hard. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And uh, once this one's just like with audition, once once this one's in that high gear, it's in that high gear. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I also want want to bring up um the character of uh Heinrich. Yeah. So Heinrich is the guy who um uh, who Isabella Johnny's character is having a an affair with. Yes. But. You know, he's also been left for this fourth party. Yeah. Um, and Heinrich is played by Heinz uh, Bennett. Mm-hmm. And um, he's not an actor I'm really familiar with, but his performance, like in a film that has over the top yet amazing performances by Isabella Johnny and Sam Neill, this guy somehow stands out as being the weird one. <laughs> he really is. He really is. He's, he's so like from the there's something about his demeanor and the way yeah. he moves. And he's like this very calm, yeah. kind of like new age, like Euro Bohemian. Yeah. Who at a moment's mom. notice can just kick your ass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, at some point I thought he wanted to have sex with Sam Neill. I you know what? I'm still not sure he didn't. Right. Like I I I feel like like the Heinrich character would have been fine if you know, if he was like, no, all of us. Yeah. We're all a couple now. Yeah. <laughs> it just adds to, you know, what this movie really, you know, banks on is is awkwardness, you know. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that you brought up awkwardness because I think another thing that really works in this film's favor, but could hinder other films is the dialogue yes now the film for the most part is in english but made by europeans so let's we can just assume that this is a an an esl an english as a second language type of situation so you get dialogue exchanges where you completely understand what's going on but they are worded in ways that we would never say them right and um like say the one that comes to my mind is in the scene where sam neil arrives home and they're first in the apartment so isabella johnny is in the kitchen preparing some food and their son is in the bath and he's like going under the water and holding his breath and like you know doing different things and at one point sam neil comes out of the bathroom to the kitchen and kind of wants Isabella Johnny to come see what he's doing. Now, that's not an uncommon thing. People do that all the time with their children, with right. their pets. But what is odd is that he comes out of the room, turns to her and says, won't you come admire him? <laughs> and I understand the meaning, but like the wording of that right. is very awkward. Yeah. And there are things like that throughout the film and I think that that really plays into the overall feel um, and kind of mood of the film in a way. Because, like, even though you can understand everything that's happening, even the dialogue is off putting. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it reminds me a lot of uh, you, you brought up Flesh for Frankenstein and Blood for Dracula. Mm. You know, Udo Kier's lines of the, those films and certainly his line delivery. You know, also puts you in that very odd uh, position, you know. Yes, and, and I think, like I said, the, the the awkwardness that permeates this film always keeps you, you know, on your feet. It always keeps you off balance. Yes, uh, and I and I think that's one of the reasons why it works. Um, mm-hmm. You know, horror horror at its best, I think, comes from you know the fear of not understanding, you know. The situation, you know, a, a dark room is horrifying because you simply don't know what's in the room. Right. And that's one of the things with, with this film. And, you know, uh, our next episode, we'll be talking about Skinner And I think 
that's one of the reasons why people love and or hate uh, Skinnamarink is that it's meant to be just off-putting. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why people love or hate this film is because they don't, you know, if, if you if you if you can't enjoy riding the wave of discomfort, then yeah, you're not you're not going to be a big fan of it. Right, right. The reason why people don't like Eraserhead, you know, because they, they don't understand the the deeper meaning of like, yeah, it's meant to be uncomfortable. Yeah, you know that that's the whole point. The whole point is that this situation is is difficult and ugly and uncomfortable you know and it's awkward and you know certainly you know meeting or going up to your wife's lover you know mm-hmm. it, it's going to be awkward it's it's there's there's nothing there's no handbook you know the toughest thing about being an adult is there's no handbook for the hard stuff right and certainly you know i, I don't I, I haven't delved into the film to know if the director had gone through a bad divorce and if it was about, you know, his feelings in a relationship, you know, but even if you look at something like the shining, uh, the shining and Eraserhead are essentially about the same thing, but done in different ways. They're about, you know, I have these kids and I don't, I don't understand my feeling around children. Well, like, I, I, it's the same thing, but also in different areas. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, in, in that, in that, because because eraser head, I feel is more the anxiety of the pregnancy yeah. and the childbirth and the coming child. And the shining is about the raising of the child. Yes, yes. Is is the kid is here? Mm-hmm. What am I doing? Yeah. <laughs> Why won't this woman leave me alone? Why won't she yeah. stop? <laughs> oh. And and then you know when we get to possession, possession is the end of those relationships. Yes. Yes. Possession is when, you know, and I think it's interesting. It's fascinating to see that, you know, Sam Neill is still in love with Isabella Johnny and he's trying to figure out some way to get this to work, you mm. know, s- some way to make her stay. Yeah. You know, he's constantly at, at the beginning, he's, you know, he's constantly saying, let's just get back to the way we were, you know? Yes. And it's that that frustration. And then the interesting thing is that, you know, a Johnny's coming at it from the same idea, but from a different perspective. And she's certainly handling it differently. You know, um, when, once she's cheated on Sam, I think she probably understood that, like, she couldn't go back. Hmm. Like, it, she broke something. She went through a barrier. And now... Right, like, like it opened up a world to this whole other thing. Yeah, literally, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And the the person I feel terrible for in the movie is the son. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, and it, I, like I said, I I understand because I feel the same way about my son. Yeah. You know, because now this kid is just trying to be a little kid, mm-hmm. and you're trying to navigate life, and he's got these two lunatics that are trying to raise him and he's just trying to go to school. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we haven't talked about yet the fact that the kid's teacher yeah. is also Isabella Johnny. Yes. Yes. But the question is, but here's the question and I'll pose it to you. Is she really Isabella Johnny or is she a man? Is she manifested as an Isabella Johnny because Sam Neill looks at her as a normal, nice together woman so in his eyes, it is what his wife was. It, it could be that way because he also looks at her partially in a caretaker way for yeah. the son. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, but we may never know that. <laughs> well, but it, it, it's interesting because I, I love films like this that are not afraid to delve deep into, you know, most films deal with how we act consciously. Yeah. They deal with how people act when they're trying to live in polite society and deal with cultural norms. And they very rarely deal with the subconscious, which is all the insane shit you think and feel internally that you are afraid to say. Right. You know, because you're like, oh, my God, if I if I let someone know what I thought, felt, you know, what would they think of me? Right. And this is one of the few films that allows that to happen and gives us 
the entire subconscious of these two people. You know, it's almost as if I wish they could like flip it and then you it would flip to this other movie where it's just the two of them trying to eat dinner and nobody's talking, <laughs> but inside they're feeling all this stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. Uh, like, like they should have shot two films at the same time, <laughs> released them both under the same title, but right. not told what theater and what version they were getting. <laughs> well, the funny thing is, like you know, the other film would be so boring because it would just yeah. be you know a couple trying to put their wet marriage together and yeah, you know, be doing the best because they're doing what they think society wants them to do. Yes, and you know, it's the interesting thing with the Isabella Johnny character is that. She's doing the opposite, and she knows she knows she's doing the opposite of what society wants from her, and that's what's driving her crazy. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, she knows she's dropping the ball as far as what her expectations are meant to be. And Sam Neill's like a you know, you literally yelling at her and beating on her, saying you need to be what the wife, a normal, regular wife, and she's just not having it. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know. So it's fascinating. But I think also those are the reasons why this film has endured yeah. through years of bad home video representation. Because it has all these layers. It leads to discussions. It it lends itself well to like academic evaluation. Right. You know? So Yeah, absolutely. You know, and it's it's certainly smarter than the average bear. Yeah. And in more depth. And I think it it deals with the real horror, which is the difficulty of life. You know, right. That that day to day horror of just trying to be a person. Yes. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I don't know if, uh, you know, I gave final thoughts on the previous one. I don't know if you have final thoughts on this one. Um, I, I'm going to say that, again, I feel this is a high recommend. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I I I think you you have to have the caveat. You have to go into this movie knowing that you're not getting a narrative. Mm. This is not a Hallmark film. This is not two people work their stuff out. No, this this is about some deep. You have to go into it with a really open mind. Yeah, you know. And, and like I said, when we talk about Skinnerink, it's going to be the same thing. You yeah. have to if you don't have an open mind, it's not going to work. And I worry that people who watch film on streaming will do that thing where they're on their computer or on their phone and they look up. And if you do that with this film, forget it. Yeah, it needs it needs your attention and it needs for you to really dig in. And for a lot of people, they're like, I, I don't want to do that. I just want to enjoy a film. Fine. that That's fine. It's not for you. But for those of you who are looking for, you know, something with some depth, boy, howdy, there's a lot here for you. Hmm. all right so that is the end of our first episode i want to thank you so much josh oh, thank you rick we're finally getting around to this and uh <laughs> um i don't know if we want to give any way for people to get in touch with us but uh i don't know if if, if people have any feedback as to like how we're doing the show yeah you know do do people want more of a a rating rather than a recommend um uh, you know, like a, a thumbs up, thumbs down, or a scale of some sort. Um, I I just figured we'd go with the recommend. It seemed the yeah. easiest. <laughs> well, and, and I think because you know we're giving a pretty good long conversation about it. Yeah. It, it I, hopefully it gives people enough to you know make their own decision. And if it sounds like something that's for them, it's for them. Yeah. And if it sounds like it's not something that's for them, it's not for them. You know, we're gonna cover so many different films and types of films. Uh, there will be something that's your flavor and there's going to be, you know, films that are not your flavor. Sure thing. Yeah. You know, but like, like you said earlier about Shudder, I, I think that the importance for us is to curate uh, films. You know, I, I teach, I'm a college professor. I teach adolescents and they don't know, like they come to me all the time. Like, what should I watch? Like what's worth watching? And I think a lot of people want to know, and it is hard work nowadays because there are so many things uh, to have someone pull you aside and go, hey, you know, if you like this, mm. watch this, you know, and I think that's where hopefully our value comes in. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Josh. Yeah. Well, thanks once again. And yeah. I will talk to you again soon. Excellent.
Next time, uh, hopefully we'll be talking about an old film and a new film and enjoying that. Until that time, I'm Rick Rebello. And I'm Joshua Graffel. <laughs>